start this morning, um, rather than kind of go through a whole long thing and then get to God's word, I would love to just jump right into his word if that's okay with you. I want to invite you to stand. We're going back to James chapter 2. We're going to be in the second half of James 2 today. I'm going to start reading in verse 14. I think the Lord is doing something powerful here today, so let's go after his word today. James writes this. He says, what good is it Dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and it's useless. Can we pray this morning? Lord, we need you. We need you. Every hour, we need you. And Lord, what a joy it is to be able to express our thanks and express our worship, our adoration back to you. And Lord, what what an awesome moment where we can just come before you and come to your altar and ask you to just tear away chains and set people free. And Lord, what a humbling moment it is to open up your word and allow you to speak to us. And you are, you are speaking to us today. And so this time, Lord, we dedicate to becoming more and more like you. Draw us close. Change us from the inside out. Let us help, just help us walk this out the way you want us to walk it out. So this, this moment, these next moments as we open your word and read together, as we study together, it's worship. It's our reasonable service to you. So open up our ears and open up our hearts, open up our minds. Most importantly, Lord, would you open up our spirits so that we can receive what you want to say to us today. And all God's people said amen. 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 Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Well, I am so excited to be back with you again. We are in week number two of our fall series, A Better Way. And just, it's, I am always excited to get to share God's word with you. It's just such a, it's an honor. It's so humbling. Um, and as I do every single week, my favorite thing to do is to give honor away. And I neglected to do something a few weeks ago, and I should have, um, but I didn't. So I'm going to make up for it. I'm going to do it today. I want to give honor uh, to some very special people today. A number of Sundays ago, um, we had a couple here in the church, a very young couple, Um, who celebrated a 50th wedding anniversary. Ben and Mary, I don't don't see Ben, but I see Mary back there. I saw Ben earlier, will you wave? Come on, let's give Ben and Mary some love. 50 years, are you kidding me? 50 years, I just just wanna tell, there's Ben right there, give it up for Ben, woohoo! We love these guys so much. Beth and I have been in a life group with Ben and Mary for a number of years, and it's just been such a joy to get to know them. Um, If you haven't got to know them, guess what? You need to, because they're amazing people. So we just honor and celebrate you guys, and thanks for being just such an awesome example to the rest of us of what faithfulness really looks like. So we just want to say, your church family, we honor you, and congratulations to the both of you. And I apologize that it took me a few extra weeks to say that. So, Uh, but I... I want to get after God's word today. If you're just joining us, like I said, week number two of our four-week fall series called A Better Way. And what we're doing is we are just heading back all this past spring. We took eight weeks to go through the first chapter of the book of James. And we just picked at it verse by verse by verse to see what he wanted to say, not only to the church in Jerusalem, but also what he wanted to say to us. And that's what we're doing in these next four weeks looking at chapters two and chapter three and seeing, James, what are you telling us? What did you tell the church in Jerusalem? And what are you telling us here in the 21st century? There's a better way. And we're gonna see that there's, there's several topics that he really cares about. And he just focuses all of his attention 
on the couple problems that he needed to address in the early church. Next week, I think can be one of the most powerful messages in this series. Week number three, I want to really encourage you to be here for it. And we're going to go through a message called Words Matter. The things that we say have power. They have consequence. The things that we say, actually, when we look at the scriptures, they're going to say it has the power of life or death. So we need to understand that the things that we say really do matter. Week number four, James kind of wraps all three of these topics that we're going to go through uh, under that kind of the umbrella, there's a better way. And so we're going to get a good look at what he means by that. And that's week number four. If you were were with us last week, you were, uh, I hope you were encouraged. I hope you were challenged by our message. It was called Change the Story. And we just went ahead and we tackled the topic of discrimination, not just racism, not just sexism, but discrimination of all kinds. What did James have to say about that? And our, our very simple stance was this. Discrimination is sin, and it breaks the heart of God. Discrimination is sin, and it breaks the heart of God. James, writing to the church in Jerusalem, was helping them understand because they were favoring rich people over the poor that they were committing a sin. He, he, we saw that James applied one of the commandments, love thy neighbor as thyself, and showing that, well, because you're favoring this group of people who look like they can do something for you, you are actually discriminating against another group of people who actually needed you. Discrimination is sin. Treating people poorly, discriminating against them, or treating people more favorably, it's sin. And I'm not just talking about Race, it can be for anything. We talked about race and religion, creed. We talked about political affiliation. We talked about sexual identity or sexual preference. And we also talked about financial status. Like all of those things and the grace that God gives us covers all of those things. And so how are we interacting? So if you weren't with us from last week's message, I encourage you uh, go to YouTube or go to the church website and pull that message up. I hope it's challenging and encouraging for you. And where we landed on that one is just very simply, it's the same statement that Pastor Michelle said uh, a number of weeks ago, that there's just, there's no room for discrimination inside the message of the gospel. There's no room for it. And so that's where we're going to build off today. And so the question really is, well, how do today's scriptures and last week's scriptures, how do these two things fit together? Because really it's it's two parts of, of one message. And we looked specifically last week at Kind of the problem that inserting over history, inserting chapter and verse numbers into the scriptures have sometimes distorted or have helped us kind of misunderstand what the intent of some of the writers of scripture were really trying to communicate. And so we went to this scripture. I want to show you this. This is James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And this section of scripture truly is the lead in for last week's message and today's message. Look what James writes. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, just a little thing to clue in, that's the lead-in for next week as well. Um, If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. I love that kind of that paradigm that he sets up there, the true and genuine religion and not letting the world corrupt you. That's really the theme of all three of these topics that we are gonna be looking at. And what he's really telling that church is true and genuine religion changes the way you think, it changes the way you act, and it changes the way you talk. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. How does it change the way that we act? So just like last week, a preacher's, you know, it's a home run for preachers. It's a dream to preach just one point. Last week's single point topic was discrimination is sin and it breaks the heart of God. James is doing the same thing. He didn't ease us into another topic with a nice like soliloquy getting us into, you know, a nice transition. It was right off the bat. Here's what he's saying. Verse 14, what good is it? Dear brothers and sisters, I like how he kind of cushions it with that, like, oh, dear brothers and sisters, what good is it if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? So today's point, the message he's trying to convey is this. It's very simply, real faith is at work. Faith works, 
Real faith is at work. It works. For James and his audience, one of the hallmarks of being a Christ follower was taking care of the poor, taking care of the orphans, taking care of the widows, people who were really marginalized in society. And that's why we talked about that last week. Like there's no room for discrimination because the call as Jesus followers is to care for the marginalized because guess what? Spiritually speaking, we were marginalized. We're marginalized because of our sin. And what did Jesus do? He brought us in. Father to the fatherless, defender of the weak. It's right in that Psalm 68 that John had during worship today. Last week, we learned James is confronting his readers with the thought of favoring the rich over the poor. And that's just one example. And we can unpack this. Watch the news and we can unpack this for hours. But here's what he means by faith works for his audience. It's verses 15 and 16. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? What he's saying, he's confronting them that the result, the output of their faith, he's confronting just empty words, just idle talk, nothing to it, meaning less. He's telling telling them you're saying one thing and, and, and not even doing something else. Like you've heard that say, like you say one thing and you do something else. It's, it's not even that, it's worse. You're saying one thing and then doing no thing. No thing, it's empty, meaningless, worthless faith. faith. It's a facade, it's a shell. It's a dried husk of a faith that has no purpose. And he says it's dead, it's dead, empty, Faith, And it's not the first time that he's brought this topic up. We're only in chapter two, and he already brought this topic up once before, didn't he? Do you remember that from James chapter one? Let's look at verse 22 here. What's he say? Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. So two times in the matter of just a couple paragraphs, he says, you're fooling yourselves. That's a, that's a harsh statement, isn't it? It's a warning. It's a stern warning to his readers. Don't fool yourself. Like the connotation here is kind of like, well, you know, if you meet someone who's starving and has no clothes and it's cold and they have nowhere to stay and you're dressed and maybe you're walking around with your, heaven forbid, pumpkin spice latte, (laughs) hashtag PSL, dumb thing has its own branding now. The 2,000 calorie death drink. Sorry, that's a tangent. (laughs) Did you know that's what actually got me addicted to Starbucks was the pumpkin spice latte and now I refuse to drink them? Anyways, and you say, be warm, be fed, have a nice day. They know that you're fooling yourself. They know it, don't they? James is saying that to his audience, the poor people know that your words are worthless. They know it. How about us? What do our friends, our family, our coworkers who know we're Christ followers, what do our actions say to them? Not just the words we say say to them. Is there a gap? Is it dry, empty, Aaron? Is it a facade or is it life-giving? James is addressing a real problem. I mean, this is a, a, an actual problem. He probably could have inserted names. Joe, Bob, fill in your name, whatever it is, don't do this. But he's addressing a real problem. And the reason why we can learn from it is because it's still a problem today. That's why we talked about discrimination last week. It hasn't gone away. And this is still a problem today. It's a trap, and it was really easy for us to step into this. And he said, James says in verse 17, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. 
uh, the NIV translates that section of uh, the, the phrase, unless it produces good deeds, it uses the words, unless it's accompanied by action. Like unless you do something with it, unless something happens, it's useless. And the word that is used for dead and useless, the connotation there is barren. Like even like a, 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 a woman who can't bear children, barren. Um, another, another word that can get used for that is, think of a, uh, and he gets to it at the end of the scriptures, I'm spoiling the ending, lifeless, like breathless, a breathless body, empty. Dead and useless, it's pointless. But true, genuine, real faith produces proof. It produces good deeds. It's active. It makes a difference. It's at work both hearing and then doing, putting it into practice. Dead faith is knowing the truth and not doing anything with it that would make a difference in the world. True faith produces life-giving results. Can I say that one more time? True faith produces life-giving results. Now, James is kind of jumping the gun and playing devil's advocate a little bit. He knew what some of his readers would say as we move on in verse 18. Look, at he says, now some of you might argue, well, some people have faith and some people have good deeds. And, and, and I think in a lot of ways, we kind of do this too, especially when it comes to like spiritual gifts. Well, I have the spiritual gift of faith and I'm gonna stay over here and be faithful. And you have the spiritual gift of doing stuff. So you go do stuff and I'll stay over here and be full of faith. But what he's saying here is, how can you show me your faith if there's no good deeds? It's like throwing you know, raw materials into a hopper on one end of an assembly line and then nothing comes out, right? No widgets or Fords or whatever's going through. You put something in, there's got to be an output. This is what he's talking about. You pour in and something, is, something good has to come out. I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Now, this is a section of scripture that has tripped a number of our Christian brothers and sisters up over the years. And you've maybe have heard this before where they talk about earning salvation by the things that they do. Have you heard that before? That you can earn salvation by doing good works. And I am so glad. This is why I love how the Holy Spirit works in our church. I hope you read that Ephesians 2 scripture. Actually, Adam, I'm I'm calling an audible. Will you find that for me? Find that Ephesians chapter 2 scripture that John had up um, during worship. Because Paul writes to the church at Ephesus that you can't earn salvation. Actually, it's the whole point that you can't earn salvation. Because if you earn it by the things that you do, It's not really a gift, but look what he says here. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the what? Good things we have done. Salvation's a gift. So this has twisted up a number of our Christian brothers and sisters because they are equating works with what's called justification the purchase, the ransom price that Jesus purchased is what they're talking about. And that's not what James is talking about. James is talking about the result of the salvation that you've received, the result of the change that Jesus is making inside of you is gonna come out and you're gonna do stuff. There's gonna be an outward result. He goes on, he says, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good on you. You just hear the sarcasm dripping from that statement, like good for you, double thumbs. (laughs) Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish, can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? And that, that phrase, that phrase right there 
would have screamed at his readers. And I'm going to show you why. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Or the NIV and other translations will say, you believe that God is one. And as soon as he would have said that, they would have known exactly what they were saying. And I'm going to show you what it means. There was a daily prayer that every Jewish person for centuries has prayed. They still pray it. It's the first prayer they pray in the morning, and it's the last prayer they pray at night. I'm going to show you the word here. It's called the Shama. And you can see the, the Hebrew word. You have to read that from right to left, Shama. And it very just simply means it's the word to hear. And so I'm going to show you a section of scripture where this prayer comes from. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it's verse four. Look at this. He said, this is what Moses passed down from the Lord to the Israelites. Hear, O Israel. So there's that word, Shama. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's that prayer. As soon as he said that, they would have immediately made the connection to this scripture. And what's it say? Here's the commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. James Just in the previous section, he added to this, didn't he? He brought in the account where Jesus was asked this very question because the the Pharisees that were talking to Jesus in this moment were trying to trip him up and get him to say, don't do this prayer. Don't do this anymore. So he says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what does he say? The second equal commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. James called this the royal law. Do you remember that from last week? That was just in the first couple moments in uh, James chapter two. He says, this is the royal law. So what he's saying is, good on you that you say these words, that you say this prayer every day. You say this, but you don't do it. That's exactly what his readers would have said. Would have, they would have made that connection. You say this, you say it out loud, you pray this prayer every day, but you don't actually do it. And so what he's basically saying to his audience is, so you're telling me that because you say this prayer every single day, you have faith. And you know, it's really easy for us to do this too, isn't it? To sing songs, worship songs, just because we know them by heart, or recite the Lord's Prayer. How many of us could just recite the Lord's Prayer right now and just rattle it off in seconds? Most of us in the room probably can. What good is it if we do that and then don't do anything with it? That's what James is saying to his audience here. And he says, look, even the demons know this, but at least they tremble in fear when they say his name. They know who he is, but at least they, they tremble. You don't do anything. They don't even measure up to that. What an indictment on that group of people. Just because you say you have faith doesn't necessarily mean that you do. The proof is in the doing, not the saying. The proof of faith is in the doing, not the saying. Faith works. It doesn't merely talk. Jabber, jabber, jabber. It's not that. So he gives us two examples. He gives his readers two examples that he can immediately connect and help them understand. We're going to see uh, two from the Old Testament, and we're going to look at two from Jesus. Actually, these are uh, portions of Scripture that we've seen many times. But look at these two that he gives here. The first example that he gives is, is Abraham. And actually, Abraham is a brilliant way for James to bring this back home. Because in saying the Shama prayer every single day in Deuteronomy chapter 6... Abraham is listed. So they will actually say the name of Abraham multiple times per day as they say this prayer. Verses 21 through 24. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. Isn't that great? His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. 
So you see, we're shown to be right with God. That's that word justified. That's why that can get so tricky to understand. We're shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith or not by words alone. Abraham is considered to be the father of the children of Israel. In fact, like I said, he's mentioned in that Shama prayer, so they're saying his name multiple times per day. So every time they say his name, they're going to remember his story. Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is promised by God. Abraham and Sarah, you are going to bear a child. They're 90 years old. Who wants to sign up for that? Wowza. And God promises that he is going to be the father of many nations. Abraham, actually at that time his name was Abram, believed God. Heaven forbid God says something and you believe him. You take him at his word and you have faith in what he says. Well, that's what Abraham does. He believes that God is going to deliver on his promise despite the fact. I don't know how you're going to do it. We're old, but you say you're going to do it. Now, yes, he slips up, doesn't he? He loses trust and then he comes back. God fulfills his promise. And then in Genesis chapter 2, it's like in Genesis chapter 22, what happens? God tells him, okay, I want you to go take that promised son, Isaac, and you're going to take him up on the side of a mountain and you're going to sacrifice him. Every time they say his name in that prayer, they're going to remember this story. He's commanded by God, prepare a place to sacrifice your promised son as a sacrifice. It's an unbearable test. I remember uh, Jake preached on this message back in February last year, and it was one of the best sermons I've heard on this particular story. I would go watch it again if I were you. It was amazing. It's an unbearable test, one that many of us, we struggle to understand. Well, why, why would God even do this? It's a hard story. Why would God ask him of that? They go up the side of the mountain, and the scene unfolds to the point where Isaac is bound and he's laying on the firewood. And Abraham has his arm in the air, knife in hand, ready to obey what God asked of him. But Abraham trusted God. He believed that God would deliver him. His faith was more than just words. Like he had to walk that out. He had to put it into action. But because of his obedience and because of his faith, God counted him as righteous. It wasn't just words. Rahab is the second example. James writes in verse 25, Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Do you remember that story? Joshua chapter two, the scene is the nation of Israel is on the shore of the Jordan River ready to step into the promised land that's been promised to them for two generations and ready to take the land. And their first obstacle is the city of Jericho. Massive city with fortifications that are unsurpassed. And Joshua sends out a pair of spies to go check out the city to see what the vibe is. Find out about the army. Find out about the fortifications. Find out about the city. Find out if there's any weaknesses. And the king's guard, the king of Jericho, he finds out that there are spies in the city. And he starts sending his soldiers from house to house to house, trying to rout these spies out, trying to find these spies And this woman named Rahab, she was a pagan prostitute. We have kids in the room. We'll leave it. How's that? She brings them into the house. She hides them on the roof. And when the guards come calling, she says, they went out. I just saw them going out the city gates. And they go and they chase out the doors. They lock the gates so nobody can get in. And these two slip out the back on a rope and scamper back. Why did she do this? Why? It says because she believed that their God was the one true God. The city was in an uproar. They knew what was coming. Something was going to happen. 
And it really came down to, was it going to be our God that's going to save us, or is it going to be their God to destroy us? And she believed that the God of these two spies, the God of the nation of Israel, was the one true God. Her faith spurred her to action. Because of her faith, she was spared by Joshua and the invading army. And in fact, can I say it this way? Because of her faith, her entire family tree was changed. Did you know that? Her entire family tree was changed. Not only that, the entire course of human history was changed because of Rahab, the pagan prostitute. Matthew chapter 1. It's the genealogy of Jesus. Do you remember that? Abraham begat Isaac and begat, 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 which is like the greatest word ever when you read the King James Version. (laughs) But verse 5, the daughter of Rahab, right in Jesus' genealogy, that decision to step out in faith changed everything. Faith without works. It's meaningless. Faith works. Faith in the Lord motivated more than just words. It motivated demonstrations of faith. That's Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Do you remember that chapter? By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. It wasn't stories of the things that they said. It was stories of the things that they did. Faith was put to work and it made a difference. Jesus has two examples here. Uh, one is a very interesting story. I remember uh, back right before the, the week of Easter, it's, it's called Palm Sunday, and there's a story where Jesus goes and has his triumphal entry. He goes from the little town of Bethany and has this triumphal parade. It's kind of his coronation as king in Jerusalem. At the end of that day, they actually slip back down into Bethany. They don't stay the night in Jerusalem. They go back down to Bethany. And in, in Matthew chapter 21, they're walking down that road back down to the town of Bethany, and Jesus is hungry, and he sees a fig tree on the side of the road. And that time of year, fig trees would have fruit on them. This fig tree only had leaves. And a fig tree that only had leaves meant either was one of two things. Either its fruit had already come and gone, or it wasn't going to produce any kind of fruit. And Jesus calls that tree out. What good are you? What good are you, fig tree, if you don't produce fruit? It's the proof, right? The proof of a fig tree is a fig. It's its one job. Make a fig. One fig. It's funny, but it's true. Jesus cursed that tree. Never again will you bear fruit. Jesus had pretty stern words for that. We need to listen to that. And I want to read this to you. This is a very interesting section of scripture, and it ties perfectly into this. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read several verses, actually verses 15 through 23. And I want these to sink in as we start coming to a close here this morning. Matthew writes, these are Jesus' words. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Look at all these words, produces. Look at this, produces, produces. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Isn't that powerful? These are Jesus' own words. And this is what Paul has in mind. He's, or, excuse me, James has in mind. The actions, the output, the things that you do, the results are the fruit of your faith, not just talk. And Jesus actually addresses the idle talk 
in the next verse. It's not even changing the topic. He just keeps on going. And he says this, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, talk. Cast out demons in your name, talk. And performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. That was James from last week, wasn't it? You can say, well, I don't murder and I don't steal and I'm not an adulterer. But what was James's point? If you break the love your neighbor as yourself, you're as guilty of law breaking as any of these other people. That's why this is all, it's the same conversation. I should have preached a two hour message last Sunday, but I wanted to come back today. So what's James trying to say? James isn't saying that talking about faith is a bad thing. Like, look, it's important to talk about faith. It's good to talk about spiritual things. It's good to grow and talk with other Christ followers that can spur us on and push us to greater depths in our faith. That's a good thing. What he's confronting here is people who only talk about faith never doing anything with it until it's an empty shell kind of a faith. Talking about faith matters or talking about the importance of faith or talking about spiritual things, but not making any kind of difference in the people that are around you. That's what he's talking about. Maybe you've heard this statement before. And it's kind of a scathing indictment, but sometimes those of us in the church, and I'm speaking about myself too, It's really easy to get sucked into this trap and only talking it, but not walking it. Have you ever heard this statement? Well, they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. Have you ever heard that? They're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. That's like, I love being in the presence of the Lord. I could be in the presence of the Lord all the time. I would just love to stay here and never leave and never do anything and just... It kind of almost has like this spiritual gluttony kind of feel, like just feed me, give me more, give me more, and then I can't move and I can't do anything. Our faith should make a difference in the people who are around us. That's why we talked about the discrimination thing last week. Because of our faith, the way we view people should be different. The way we treat people should be different. Because we love God with everything we are, because of what Jesus has done for us, because of the eternal life that was so freely given to us, and by the way, given to everybody else around us, we need to become difference makers for everyone else around us. That's changing the story, changing the narrative. Can I say it this way? The same power that rose Christ from the dead, which is actually in that section of scripture uh, in Ephesians right there, the same power that rose Christ from the dead that's alive in you, that's been planted in you by Jesus, wants to be at work through you, making a difference in the people around you. Like the Lord in you wants to be at work through you. The Holy Spirit filled you with his presence so he can demonstrate through you, yes, you, a broken, hurting, wounded person that he's made right in the sight of God. He wants to use you, he wants to use me, he wants to use us to demonstrate, to prove that Jesus is real and he's at work and alive. He's filled you with power for ministry, boldness for witness, and effectiveness in reaching people for him. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is. Faith that is just talk and never does is a decorative, ornamental faith that has no value whatsoever. You know what, like, that comes to mind for me? Go to that Chinese restaurant, you got that cat. Is that thing worth anything? 
They're always like shiny plastic gold too, aren't they? That cat has one job, it's this. That's worthless. Your faith is not that. Your faith is alive and it's vibrant and it's meant to make a difference. Whether you're two or 82, an unproductive faith is a faith that is worthless. That's why he wraps this section of scripture up with this phrase. Just as the body is dead without breath, there's that barren, lifeless, empty connotation again. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. What's he saying? He's just saying true and genuine faith is at work. It works. It just works. It does things. I, there's an, an author that I love. I actually uh, had a chance to sit under some of his teaching a number of years ago. Is anyone familiar with the name Bob Goff? I'm going to put his picture on the screen here. Bob Goff uh, is a author, is an author. He is a lawyer. I love the fact that he calls himself a recovering lawyer as someone who was uh, on track to be a, a lawyer way back in the day. I love that thought, like a recovering lawyer. Um, and he's a Christ follower. He loves Jesus with everything that he is. He has worked uh, in social justice circles. He is uh, just advocating seriously for kids. I mean, he will go and represent kids in other nations to rescue them out of slavery and get them into the United States. He's an amazing guy. He's also nuts. He's crazy. He's like an eight-year-old in a 65-year-old body. Look at this picture. This is like what he does every single day. This is who he is. He has so much zeal. He has so much love for life because of what Jesus has done in him that he just wants it to be infectious and reach everybody else around him. And he just says it this way. And we've said this phrase a number, I mean, a number of times in our church because it's taking those two commandments and simplifying them to the absolute most simple possible way that we can. Love God and love people. Love God and love people. But he takes it one step further. He says, love God Love people and do stuff. Like, do stuff with your faith. Go make a difference for someone. That's why there's power in really simple gestures, like paying for someone's pumpkin spice latte in the car behind you. Simple expressions of faith can make a world of difference. We said it this way last week, remember? Why would you want to rob yourself of being a blessing when you might be somebody's answer to prayer, put your faith to work and make a difference. If you really love people just as much as you love God, that's the call. Loving everybody else as much as you love God, you're gonna be motivated to act. Love does stuff. It isn't passive. Love has to be active. Love results in actions that help change the lives of other people. And it has to be with the same way with our faith. Love God, love people. And the result is gonna be caring for the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the brokenhearted, the hurting, the wounded, the widows, the orphans, the poor. Put your demographic in there. That's church. That's what being Christ followers means. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying this, discrimination is sin and it breaks the heart of God and real faith is at work. Faith works. Faith just works. Can I pray with you this morning? Lord, we never, 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 never do we want to be known here at Real Life Church as Christ followers, as people who just talk. We don't want to be all talk. You've made it so clear through the story of Scripture and especially your story that true and genuine faith, loving God and loving people means that we will be people of action, not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. When we see, when we meet marginalized people, when we connect with strangers uh, at work or at, in the marketplace or at school, whatever it might be, Lord, will you help us be brave to see past the people, the, the group, the statistic, the number, whatever it might be, and see that person just the same way you see them. 
Help us reach beyond just the comforts of our own. And giant air quotes around that, our own. And reach out with the kind of love that does good things. Help us be more like talk, more than just talk. Help us be more like you and just do. And Lord, we're going to need you for that. And you've met us in a powerful way this morning. And Lord, I'm so thankful for that. And what I'm praying right now, even in these moments here as we're, as we're wrapping up and leaving, Lord, meet us in a powerful way. And maybe you just, you just need to acknowledge to the Lord, that, that's me. I, I, enough talk. I, I need to step up my game. The Lord is calling me to act more. Maybe you should just slip your hand up. No one's looking around. That's me. Doers of the word, not just hearers. That's me today. Lord, meet us, embolden us, fill us with your spirit, do good things through us, and help us make a difference, we pray. Then everyone said amen. 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 Amen.